Good evening, Slashaholics, and wel welcome to episode number three of Slash Tracks Reviews. My name is Alex Vanover, and I am joined, as always, by the 80s slasher librarian, Mr. Josh LaRue. But we are also joined uh, tonight by a very special guest, uh, my friend, Josh's friend, and your friend, acclaimed author, uh, movie star now, <laughs> Mr. Anthony Brownlee. Anthony, welcome to the show, buddy. Thank you for having me. Oh, dude, absolutely. Um, Anthony, so I was going over your bio here, buddy. You're an author, first and foremost, and that's your passion. Yes. You've, you've written Bloodshed, Clandestine, A Story of Two Brothers, The Last Victim, and you're also right now starring in Fredheads, the documentary that was released in theaters less than six months ago. You went to a big-time movie premiere uh, it's available on Amazon Prime now. You can find it there. I believe it's coming to Tubi. Um, yes. Okay, where are some other places we can find Fredheads, and where are some places that we can purchase your books? Uh, you can find my books uh, all on Amazon. Um, I'm on social, all my social medias. Uh, there should always be a link um, that goes directly to my books on Amazon. So that way you don't have to, like, you know, get lost in the shuffle. Um and then Fred Heads, yeah, as of now, uh, Amazon Prime, uh, you can actually buy it on DVD, and it oh, will sweet. be coming to Tubi June 25th, so just a little over a month from now to be on Tubi. That's crazy that it's going to be on Tubi, because Tubi, I think, now for horror fans, has overtaken Netflix as, like, oh, the yeah. go-to streaming service for horror. Um it just has way better, uh, way better selection, and and uh, just way more. I think niche things are available on Tubi too. Like a lot of really great documentaries, like your guys' movie, is going to be available. So that's that's a really nice place for it to land. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, that was one of our main reasons to definitely have it on Tubi. Yeah, for sure. I uh, I actually just bought it uh, two weeks ago on what was it? Amazon Prime, and. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make a confession, man. I had a I had a coupon, so I saved three dollars. So don't t don't tell Paige that I used a coupon. Don't. Nice. Nicole had a coupon, so I saved three bucks. So don't I don't know how that works. You probably still got paid on the back end. So don't let Paige know. <laughs> I didn't even know there was coupons for Amazon Prime. No, she had a coupon, dude. It. She had. I don't know that there is. I don't think it comes in like a circular or something. But it like she she had a coupon on her account, like a three dollar credit or something. So I was like, because I think to rent it, it's like $9.99, but to buy it, it's like $12.99 or something. So I was like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to buy the damn thing because I'm just going to, I'm going to, I want to be able to go back to it whenever I want to. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so now, hey, Anthony, you're, you're in for a treat, buddy. Uh, the Slashaholics, you're going to become one of us now. One of us. One <laughs> of us. One of us. And we are getting into the meat and potatoes of Slash Tracks reviews. We're, we're going through the whole Nightmare on Elm Street series. We've already reviewed uh, the first film, the 1984 classic. Uh, our previous episode, episode number two, was Freddy's Revenge. But this is the one that I've been looking forward to. I know, Anthony, you've been looking forward to it. Josh, I know you love this film. We are going to be reviewing The Dream Warriors. Yes. Hell yeah. And Josh, I'm excited to have Anthony on the show for this specific episode because Anthony is the go-to guy for any and everything Dream Warriors. And let me tell you why. Because before we linked up on YouTube, before there was a Slash Tracks, before there was a Slash Tracks news, before there was a Slash Tracks reviews, or me and you doing bad Batman and Joker voices and <laughs> dubbing it over the 1960s Batman cartoons for blooper reels. I was listening to Anthony on Elm Street Radio with Paige and Deandra, and they were discussing the original Dream Warriors script that was written by Wes Craven. Um, and I, what, Wes, wasn't it Wes Craven and uh, Bruce, Bruce Wagner? Wagner. Right. Yeah, Bruce, Bruce Wagner wrote the, the original first Dream Warriors script. They discussed that in detail on uh, Elm Street Radio. And I listened to that like two or three years ago, or maybe even four years ago, Anthony. It was a while ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. I'd yeah. say, I'd probably even say like maybe even five, four or five yeah. years ago. <laughs> yes, because I think I wasn't, I wasn't even in Eugene at the time. I was, I was heavily into Elm Street. Like, I was a big Elm Street uh, radio stand. Like, any time that Paige and John would put anything out, I'd be like the first one <laughs> to like pull it up and bug the shit out of them in the comments. So, 
uh yeah i remember when that came out i remember learning a bunch about that production that i had no idea about uh anthony you told me and you even speak on it on that episode of elm street radio you say that like uh freddie was way darker right oh, in yeah. the original oh yeah mm-hmm. like he was using the c word quite a bit <laughs> right right yeah he wasn't calling anybody a bitch. He was just using the word that my mom, my mother would slap my face if I said that word in the house. Like, like you don't say that word. And Freddie, he was just, he had no remorse for anyone. He was just straight up gutting people. Uh, there was no, it was less jokey. It was really dark in tone. That's what I love. Like, I, I really would have loved to have seen that version because I've always loved dark Freddie. Like, you know, mm-hmm. from one and two. And the way Wes wrote him, like, he was like a combination of both, almost. You know, just because he, you know, he spoke a little bit more in part three. And, you know, but it seemed like a natural progression at that point, because, you know, it's part three. You know, so I feel like it would be, you know, even darker, because now he's, you know, really gaining the souls of these children. And he's Mm -hmm. getting stronger. And, you know, he's just more hungry. And, you know, now... On top of that, you know, Nancy's back, you know, his basically his arch nemesis. Yeah. You know? He's more fired I, up to like yeah. have his way. Revenge uh, would have made more sense at this point than part two. <laughs> well yeah, Freddy Freddy's <laughs> revenge. <laughs> the, if any mo- Freddy movie should have been named Revenge, it should have been Dream Warriors because Freddy legitimately was trying to have revenge on the rest of the children and specifically Nancy. Yeah. Uh, right. Exactly. Yes. Poor, poor Jesse just happened to move into the wrong house at the wrong time for the right price. Right. Uh, yeah. And I don't know how they got the damn bars off the window for Mr. Walsh uh, <laughs> prior to the family moving in and then, you know, unloading the Fu Man fingers and stuff into the kitchen. But nobody uh, ever told Shirley, though, or whatever it <laughs> was. Well, I think there's a scene in part two where Clue's character, like Mr. Walsh, he's actually like taking the bars off. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, where I Jesse's don't... like, you know, he's like, you know, leave me alone. I just want to figure this out. And then he's, you know, uh, Mrs. Walsh, like, you know, I think he needs psychological help, you know. And then, like, oh, he's you're... up there, like, taking the bars off the windows. Is that what he was doing? They didn't take yeah. the bars off the window before he bought the damn house? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Uh, I, I, I will say this about Freddy's Revenge before we dive really deeply into Dream Warriors. Uh, the scene where Freddy is downstairs and Jesse's watching him. I, I say this to everybody. I've told Josh this a thousand times. That's terrifying. When Freddy's just down yeah. there burning dolls in the yeah. in the furnace for no reason. That's, that is a creepy scene. I've always I hate that, that, that was creepy. Yeah, it's just the whole, everything about it. And Jesse, I think the scariest part about that scene to me, guys, was the fact that Jesse's looking down from his house mm-hmm. and he's on the outside and safety is usually in your house it's the complete opposite right <laughs> if he goes in his house he's a dead man like that's right and that's terrible i mean that would be completely terrifying and real just to like walk by your house and just kind of look in your basement and see like a stranger or some weird looking person in your basement <laughs> like i mean i have like a whole heart attack like, like are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> i would have thought my mom dude my mom used to do some crazy stuff i would have just thought she invited people over to have a party and it was just one of her friends she brought back from the bar or something. Oh. down there burning dolls in your basement right I, Hey, man, as long as it wasn't my G.I. Joes or my wrestlers, I would have been fine. <laughs> burn, all, burn all the damn dolls you want to. Um, Anthony, you were going to say, so the original script, though, so uh, New Line brought Wes back. They, like, mm-hmm. negotiated points on the back end from the success of the first two films that Wes Craven never originally got. He just got a cut from the first film. So Wes kind of negotiated some points. Uh, on the back end for future pro- you know, profits and back end profits, uh, mm-hmm. retroactive or whatever. And he also, wasn't he also like, he, he, what I saw was that Wes was really unhappy with Freddy's Revenge and it didn't make yeah. sense to him. So yeah. he wanted a chance to kind of right the ship and end it on a correct note in his mind. Mm-hmm. So Dream Warriors was supposed to be the end of the franchise, by the way, guys. Did you guys know yeah. that? Yeah, that, that I did know. Yeah, they weren't yeah. sure if, they, if it was going to be like a a part four because they, you know, they like they always said like you know, as a commercial success as Nightmare Two was, it was kind of like a artistic failure. Like you know, mm-hmm. they weren't really happy with it. So you know, Dream Warriors was supposed to be kind of like the rectum of like part two, and 
you know, I mean, I, and obviously, I mean, it was such a good job. I mean, it was a great way to kind of, you know, if that was going to be it, it was kind of a great way to like, you know, round up because now it's the last of the Elm Street children. So now we have the last of them. And, you know, you bring back your, you know, sole survivor of your first one who's like now grown and can uh, explain everything, you mm-hmm. know, because they were basically lost. They had no idea. They, they didn't even know his name. You know, up until, you know, Nancy's monologue, which is, by the way, that's my favorite monologue of any film ever. Like, I've made several posts about that. I just love the way that Heather, like, delivers that that line just to, you know, you know, Kincaid's like, you know, don't humor us. We're not in the mood to, you know, hear anything. And all she has to say, you know, he wears a dirty brown hat and, like, that's it. And then it's like she grabs yeah, they know. all their attention, like, right there. And it's just like, I, and, it's, and then that music cuts in. It's like, it's it's such an awesome scene. So what I was going to say, yeah, like the, the movie was such a success that Wes couldn't even end it on the note that he wanted to. (laughs) He was like a victim of his own creative genius. It was like, cause whenever Wes Craven hit a home run, it wasn't just a home run. It was like a grand slam. I mean, he did the same thing with scream he did right. the same thing with the first nightmare. He did the same thing with Dream Warriors. Uh, yeah, some of his films that aren't even uh, critically acclaimed, like Vampire in Brooklyn. Uh, oh, I, love that I love that movie. Um, Shocker. I really like Shocker. Love Shocker. People Children Under, under the Stairs. stairs. Love um, I think Wes Craven gets a bad rap because they're comparing they're comparing his other films to his masterpieces. I think that's kind of like comparing. Michael Jordan to like it's like a championship season to like when he lost in the Eastern Conference Finals or something. It's like <laughs> you were still in the top four, but you didn't win the whole damn thing. I don't know. So I think yeah. it's kind of an unfair situation. But West decided to come back. He wrote the script for Dream Warriors. Um, he was back in the good graces of Bob Shea and New Line, and ultimately he couldn't direct the film. So he ended up having to take a, a step back. And once New Line got their hands on his script. They decided to almost rewrite the entire thing. They took a lot of characters and molded them together. Like Laredo, for instance, uh, Mm -hmm. Will, Ira Hyden. His character was kind of a a mix mash of, wasn't, uh, of Philip and Will were kind of the same character because didn't he make the puppets? Or was that Joey? Which one? In the original script, do you guys remember who who made the puppets? Uh, Well, I know Laredo made the house in the original yes. script. He made Not the house Kristen. instead of Kristen. Yes. Right. And I can't think, because Philip is in the original script, but he's young. Him and Jennifer are younger. He's like 13. He's like 13 and Jennifer's yeah. like 14. Like, they're like yes. kids, you know. But, you know, if you watch the theatrical version, they're more like, you know, I would say more like 16. 16, you know, 17. Like so. sophomore, junior in high school. Yeah, somewhere around there. And then um, Taryn, she was actually a black girl in the original mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh Kincaid was you know he was I feel like his character was like older than almost the rest and, and which was strange is they they didn't even like know each other and some of them weren't even really from Springwood you know oh, that exactly. they were talking really? about. it's like they got just kind of found and then they were all kind of brought into Weston Hills for you know one reason or another which was really kind of an interesting you know kind of like subplot with that which I thought was kind of interesting I, one thing similar to that for like the first Nightmare on Elm Street when it's a deleted scene where Nancy's talking to her mother in the basement and her mom Marge is basically saying like you know all of you had older siblings right. uh, that were killed by Freddy um, mm-hmm. it's kind of similar to that it's like so all those kids uh, didn't know they were connected but they still found each other ultimately right. because of Freddy mm-hmm. so even if they didn't know, you know, even if they didn't know what the hell was going on, Freddie certainly did. Apparently, <laughs> apparently, uh, playing him like a chessboard. Obviously, that's that's crazy. Have you guys ever thought about? Um, this is totally off topic. Have you guys ever thought about how Freddie kills people? Like he doesn't just like he could just kill you instantly, but he just mm-hmm. he literally has a whole elaborate situation set up uh, <laughs> based on your likes and dislikes and right. it plays it plays a game with you and if he doesn't get you you say you escape you wake up it's like well you know damn i'll get you next time like <laughs> you know cat, what i mean cat playing with the mouse man yeah that's exactly that's what it is yeah and I, 
I mean, because he's, he's, that's why, to me, Freddy's the deadliest out of, like, you know, a lot of the 80s, you know, monsters. And that's another reason I don't consider the Nightmare franchise to be a slasher franchise, because to me, it's always deeper, because, you know, it's, you know, it's all up here. And he's up there with, like, all your good thoughts, all your bad thoughts, and he can, like, mm-hmm. manipulate those thoughts. And one of those that I love is um that scene with Kristen. Like, you know, when it first opens, you know, she's, you know, making the house, and she's playing the music loud, and her mom comes in like, no, are you crazy? Like, you wake up the whole neighborhood, and, you know, and her mom's kind of dismissive of her when she's trying to tell her, like, you know, these dreams are still kind of bothering me, and, like, you know, she really doesn't want to be alone, but she's like, well, I have a date. So, you know, basically just get over it. And then, like, later on when, you know, she wakes up again, she thinks, like, you know, the whole thing's just a dream, and, like, her mom comes in a second time, but this time she's more, like, open, like, you know, like, you know, send her off to bed, she's smiling at her, and, um, you know, it's almost like that's how Kristen, you know, in her mind wished it would have gone, and exactly. Freddie knew that, so it's like, let me get her with this, and then basically, like, oh, it's this thing, and he basically takes it away, because he's standing right outside, and, you know, basically chops her head off, and it's just like, Damn. you know, so it's like, it's really, it's really a, just this huge mental just rape basically yeah you know that's... This, like what i call it. it's just you know he you know like she said like you know it's a cat and mouse thing but it's like a, a deeper cat and mouse thing mm-hmm. because it's it's really playing on your fears it's playing on your emotions you know and you know to me that's what makes freddy like the most deadly you know that's next level uh evaluation of that scene anthony i've never thought of it in that con that in that in those terms of like her mom is a bitch she is not a good person (laughs) Kristen is a pain in the ass to her because she wants to go have cocktails at the country club and she's looking for a man or whatever um everybody had a friend's mom who everybody knew somebody's mom like that uh growing up Mm -hmm. and Kristen was hoping that you like freddie freddie knew exactly how he wanted her (laughs) how she wanted her mom to behave and you know, gotcha, bitch. Like, got her immediately. He could have killed her right there, too, by the way. Right. No problem. Um, that's that's, that's really interesting. The fear. Yeah. It's like yeah. a different form of torture. It's like, you know, not actually touching you. It's just, like I said, it's an emotional torture. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, it, and that, that really, because that really weakens people. Like, when you're playing on somebody's, like, emotions and things that are, like, you know, deep, dark to them that, you know, really, you know, kind of get them, you know, that, you know, it's, it's doing something without actually physically doing something to them. Like, you know, that, that's another way of weakening somebody, you know? Oh yeah. It's like, in Dodge- like that's what Rick does. Dude, it's just like in dodgeball when Vince Vaughn says to Ben Stiller, he's like, you look, your ass looks kind of fat in those jeans, uh, white. <laughs> And then Ben Stiller kind of like looks back at his ass and he's like, it was like psychological warfare that Vince was doing. Right. Do you guys remember that scene at all? <laughs> I actually haven't watched that in so long. I have to like, I'd have to like give that one a Dude, revisit. Ben Stiller used to be like 500 pounds and Vince Vaughn just, just like Ben Stiller's doing his like crazy gym owner, evil villain thing. And Vince Vaughn just says the one thing like to fuck with him. Like your ass looks pretty fat. <laughs> That's a very Freddy S quote. Right. Uh, so let, let's get into a, a little bit of the. Well, actually, we haven't even talked about the. the let's do a brief plot description. So okay. if you guys are still with us, slash Alex, here we go. Uh, so here's the deal the movie starts out uh, introducing us to a new character named Kristen Parker. And she's kind of in the middle of a nightmare. She's running from Freddy uh, immediately. So we. It's like a continuation from the first film, and it's like we just jumped from, like, part two never really happened, guys. Uh, Kristen's running from Freddy in the Elm Street house, 1428. She's attempting to save a little girl. Uh, She ends up down in the basement with a bunch of teens hanging from nooses who Freddy obviously, like, hung his corpses up, which, by the way, that scene is terrifying to me. Uh, Mm -hmm. Just all those dead teens. That's that's yeah. fucking nuts, man. Uh, it's really, that's a gnarly scene. Uh, Freddy's coming down the hallway. He's going to get her. Uh, and just before she gets hacked and hacks, you know, hacked to bits, she wakes up. So Kristen Parker's our new uh, pr- protagonist of the film, I guess. She's the new star. Uh, Fair assumption. Yeah, she's having, <laughs> she's having <laughs> nightmares. 
uh, we're introduced to uh, her mom uh, who wants her to go to bed. She's eating uh, Folgers <laughs> crystals with a spoon. Uh, she doesn't even have a coffee pot like Nancy Thompson anymore. She's just straight <laughs> up eating the coffee <laughs> with a spoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a couple moments later, Freddie's trying to get her. Uh, she goes to the bathroom in her dream, and she ends up slitting her wrists, which leads her to Weston Hills, which is a – like because you know, she supposedly – had a suicide attempt, but it was ultimately Freddie trying to kill her. She ends up meeting a lot, a lot of other kids in the hospital who also are dealing with the same uh, dream stalker. So that's kind of the brief plot description. And during the, during the course of the film, they all have uh, incredible attributes and different strengths that they bring to the table that they attempt to use uh, and harness to defeat Freddie because Nancy Thompson, the OG star uh, of the first film, shows up and she's going to help them, Professor Xavier style, lead them into battle against Freddie <laughs> and try to take on the boogeyman and take him out once and for all. So that's kind of the brief plot description. Josh, would you kind of add or take anything away from that? Well, I'm, I'm going to pretend I've never seen it and ask you. Okay. When they put all of these powers together where they can kick ass in the dream world, does that mean that they just defeat Freddy in like five seconds and destroy him? Is, is that what happens with all their powers and everything? That's how it should have happened. Like a Megazord in the Power Rangers, they should have all like linked up. And it should have been like <laughs> Will's, Will's wheelchair should have been the base of the fucking Megazord. But, uh, and Chris, you know, and Terran's knives should have been the, like, the, the sword that, <laughs> yeah. But no, Freddy immediately separates them and tries mm -hmm. to take them out one on one because Freddy's all you know Freddy's kind of a bitch in this film. Like he doesn't want to take <laughs> on the whole he doesn't want to take on the whole group at once because I think he knows yeah he's in yeah. trouble. So he's right. but yeah. Freddy knows what they're trying to do before they even do it. I'm sure Freddy was aware uh, of what was going on because he's in there in their minds. He knows what they're planning. It's not <laughs> like he didn't know. <laughs> So it's not what's like Freddy doing when nobody's dreaming. What's, what's he doing when nobody's dreaming? What is he? What is Freddy doing? Sitting around reading the newspaper. Chilling, <laughs> man. Chilling. What is Freddy? Does Freddy eat? Anybody? Oh. Uh, well, he eat. Well, he loves soul food. So. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah. He likes pizza. Uh, <laughs> soul food. Thirty minutes. Or spring. <laughs> Huh. I have always wondered that too. Like when nobody's dreaming, is he just kind of just like you know? <laughs> and he realized somebody's always like, ah, yes. And it's just like <laughs> he's like a firefighter. <laughs> you know, he's like a firefighter. He like lives at the fucking fourteen to twenty eight house, and he's got to like slide down the Freddy pole like the Ghostbusters. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not> <laughs> Jan hey, Jan hey, Janine is like, we got one, and Freddy's like, yeah, bitch. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Him and Slimer just chilling in their fucking Elm Street house. So, okay, so that's the brief plot description. Let's get into some of the uh, the background. Let's get into some uh, bips and bobs here. So, Dream Warriors was released on February twenty seventh, nineteen eighty seven, on a four point three million dollar production budget. Dream Warriors ended up taking forty four point eight million dollars back in from the box office. So $44.8 million in 1987 is basically like $200 million in 2023. So it's just a rock solid 100% bona fide hit. So if Wes Craven had any hopes of ending the series on a high note, uh, ending the franchise the way he wanted it to, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, money stepped in and ended his plans <laughs> because there was definitely going to be a sequel. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Dream Master, I think Dream Master was, um, you know, Dream Master was obviously the sequel to Dream Warriors, but if I did my research correct, I believe Dream Master had a poster before the film was even written. Like, wasn't there a, a movie poster that was being yeah. pushed before the film was even written? Yeah, it was <laughs> something like that. They were already, like, kind of, like, on it. Like, you know, just to what, already yes. get people hyped. For like mm -hmm. a sec, you know, for a sec, or like you said, the sequel to part three. Like since it did so good, they're already just trying to get people like really amped up for it. 
and just basically saying like, okay, we gave you this, but look what else is coming. And, you know. Exactly. I think. And, um, oh, go ahead, Josh. And I mean, at least Dream Master ended up being a movie that completely respected the source material of the movie that came before, right? I, hey. Right. Yeah. When they kill Kincaid <laughs> and Joey mm. and Kristen in the first twenty-five minutes of that film, even as like a six-year-old. Okay, I was offended. I was extremely yeah. bothered by that. That alien three mad. <laughs> that pissed me I off. Was, I couldn't believe it. It was it was just so fast. And it was just like they're supposed to be the dream warriors, and it's just like bam, bam, bam. Mm-hmm. I mean, I get like you know they want to introduce house the new kill or the new uh, the new kill the new uh, heroine, but to me, I felt like they should have if they were going to end all three of them, they should have like had this thing where Freddie had been trying to come back and they were trying to find a way to destroy him and somehow, you know, they that, you know, maybe the, the first half of the movie was all going to be mostly with them dreaming and, you know, they all maybe end up dying at the same time in a blaze of glory and that's really how Freddie kind of brings himself back and then, you know, so that way he can explain, like, okay, now he's stronger because he has these three and now he can go on to the next, you know, to the next group, uh, to the next group. <clears throat> And I felt like that would have been better in the sense, like, you know, if they all died together trying to, like, fighting, you yeah. know, instead of just, like, oh, I'm back. Oh, you know, you're gone. Like, <laughs> now it's like going to the next. This is kind of like, what? Like, they never, you know. They, they never got their Young Guns moment. Like, at the end of Young Guns, when all of the regulators are in that house and it's burning up and they're, like, they're fighting. They're trying to get the hell out of the house. They definitely, I agree with you, Anthony. They should have had a moment in that film where they link up one last time, and then Freddy gets the best of them. Maybe, maybe he doesn't kill them easily. Maybe he, maybe right. he takes a bit because you know he's going against the three original members of the Dream Warriors that survived. I mean, Kristen was the leader of the Dream Warriors with Nancy. Um, right. I think that they definitely should have had their moment to to shine, and then some. Maybe one of the maybe one of the newer kids, like maybe Rick or whoever or Alice, uh, happened to be pulled in and witnessed the battle or something. Mm-hmm. And then she like kind of like voiced like, "Hey, this is what's going on." Blah blah blah. And I don't know. That could have made that would have made more sense, and it would have not been like such a slap in my face and your guys' face because yeah. yeah. I don't know. I just it, I to this day I hate I hate when it was like it was like um. Let's just get these characters off the screen as fast as we possibly can so we can get into the meat and potatoes of the new story. That's what it felt like yeah. to me. Definitely. It's like, I don't like stories yeah, like that. Yeah, we're going to definitely... It just makes it, like, rushed. Like, that would almost be like, you know, when Scream 4 came out after 10 years that Sidney, Dewey, and Gale were just killed and, like, instantly now you have these new set of kids and it'd just be like, you that know, would, what? But, that's... You, you know what I mean? Just like, wait exactly, a minute. Like, how... No. I mean, that's what it felt like, you know. Huge slap in the face. What? But, oh. until, but, but until... At least in Dream Masters, we can still see them as the... Uh, Dream Warriors, we can still see them, you know, uh, as powerful, kick-ass characters. Um, so, yeah. We got, we're going to be talking Dream Masters soon, right? Like, just jump back into Dream Warriors. <laughs> Segway. <laughs> hey, Freddie gave us Freddie gave us the map, and it said you're fucked, and it led straight to Dream Master. Okay, that's where I went. All right. So that's the budget. That's the box office. It did extremely well. Now this movie was directed by Chuck Russell. So Chuck Russell uh, has an extremely uh, by Hollywood standards, he's had a great career. Um, the screenplay, of course, was written by Wes Craven and Bruce Wagner. Uh, Frank Darabont and Chuck Russell also have credits on the screenplay. Um, and that's because they ended up rewriting the original script. So when, when, what we talked about earlier, uh, they decided to kind of lighten Freddie up a little bit, uh, kind of give him a few one-liners and ultimately <clears throat> tone down the, the super dark tone, which I think, which I, I would have loved to see the original script on screen, but I think their rewrite ultimately led to the success of what Dream Warriors became. Because this Freddy, in my opinion, is almost a perfect mix of dark and humor 
and almost like a leading man quality as a as the antagonist. Like Freddy mm-hmm. steps out and becomes the face of the franchise in this film, and I think yeah. it, we can owe it to the rewrite by Chuck Russell and Frank Darabont. What, what do you think about that, guys? I mean, I I mean, I I do agree because, like I said, I've always wanted to see the original screenplay Me on too. screen just because it was so dark. Because I love Dark Freddy, but I always did say that you know if they're gonna add that humor into it, you know, part three was the perfect you know Freddy mm-hmm. like for that. You know that that mix was good because the other ones I felt were just straight comedy. After that, you know, it wasn't he wasn't really you know, too dark or, you know, after that. Five and, was the where it jumped the shark with its humor for me. Um, really? I thought it was more six. I well, six. six the, the, like, the, I thought that, like, over, like, was over the top on all of them. Looney, like Looney Tunes. Five. The sound effects. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that, I mean, Josh, what do you think? Do you think, how, what do you think about Freddy's, uh, like, overall uh, presentation in this film? In part three, yeah, yeah, I agree. He was like, he was like the perfect embodiment of Freddy. Like, if that had, he was like just the right blend of part one and two, with just enough of the slapstick that came later, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know? So it's yeah, perfect blend of what we know as Freddy, what our generation would call Freddy. Is, Do you know uh, what it felt movie. like when Freddy like Welcome to Primetime, bitch, um, and he had a couple other one-liners. Uh, I felt like it was like that Simpsons episode where Bart said, I didn't do it. Uh, and it just blew up and became like, a, like Urkel on family matters where like, did I do that? <laughs> or like step by step, uh, you know, yeah, buddy, you know, like code man. I feel like, I feel like the, the, the creators at new line tried to recreate the welcome to primetime bitch to their own detriment. And what Anthony and what you were saying was they took one small element of the Freddy character and they amplified it. And, and, and I'm not stupid. I know exactly when Freddy's Nightmares came out. It came out right after Dream Warriors, too, by the way. And, yep. I, and I love Freddy's Nightmares because I'm a fan of anything more Freddy. So I don't – Freddy to me is like pizza. It's just – it's all good. <laughs> Some are better than the other, Right. But Freddy's Nightmares, to the casual Nightmare on Elm Street fan, did not help Freddy. I think yeah. it hurt him. Because once you start seeing the guy who's giving you nightmares hosting a TV show and making jokes for 30 to 45 minutes, it's not... I mean, I know he was just in the bumpers most of the time. Like, he would introduce the show and end the show. But that did not make me think he was scary, guys. Uh, he was a victim of his own success, his own comedic yeah. success. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I think it's really just because he was the one that did talk, you know, out of like mm-hmm. the three leading, you know, Freddie, Michael, Jason, he was the one yeah. that did talk. So it made him more popular. And it's like, you know, you want your, and that like, I think part three is really when Freddie became the anti-hero. Because I felt like in part one and two, he was just the villain. But yes. I think part three is what made him the anti-hero, and then that's what people gravitated to. And it's like, it was like all about Freddy, because before that, when Robert, or or the names on the screen as they're being introduced, Robert was always like, and Robert England is Freddy Krueger, but then starting with part four, he was at the top, and then he, he you, stayed at the top. You just stole my, you just stole exactly what I was going to say. It was like, <laughs> and towards the end, like, Freddy's dead, Wes Craven's new nightmare, all of a sudden it was like starring Robert mm-hmm. England. You know what I'm saying? Like, he went from introducing, like, introducing Robert England to, like, he's the franchise. Like, mm-hmm. can, you got, can, we, can we all agree that a certain scene from Dream Warriors helped make this Freddy so iconic? And that's the uh, puppetry scene. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yes. man. Yeah. That thing will forever be haunting. Like, that was, that's probably, like, out of that film, that's probably, that's my favorite kill in part three is the, the marionette scene. It's just... And then by all of them watching and screaming and trying to like, you know, you can see him up in the clouds, just like, it makes my feet and arms hurt every time. Every time I see it, it's like, ow. (laughs) Can can we also agree that it's probably some of the best practical effects that I've that we've ever seen? Like to this day, it -hmm. holds up. I mean, yeah, in the novelization, which I think is based on the original script and a couple other ones or something. 
Uh, mm-hmm. That's not in there at all. Freddy just drags him down the hallway and throws him in front of a van. <laughs> that's yeah. a little anticlimactic. <laughs> just imagine if that's what we got in the movie instead of the puppetry scene. <laughs> Hold on. He's all, here, jump in front of this van, bitch, and here's your puppets. And then he throws the puppets in front of the next car. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, that's how a lot of that did happen. Yeah, they. it wasn't, because in Wes's script, and well, I always try to say Wes and Bruce's script, it's um, you know, it wasn't really about the effects in that, in that script. You could really tell that it was really about the story and how Nancy's on this mission trying to find her dad and all this stuff is happening in between. And she, you know, happens to stumble upon finding Neil, and you know, he realizes that she knows more, like knows so much about dreams that she could be of assistance to this group that he's helping. Mm-hmm. And it's really because Wes was really all about characters and story. You know, it's like the characters themselves. Like, you know, he never wanted in his scripts that Freddie be like the main top over. Because if you look at all the nightmares he was part of, part one, Freddie's hardly in it. Like, when you really watch it, he's hardly in it. And Wes Craven's new nightmare, he's hardly in it. It's about Nancy, you know, and especially in the first one about Nancy, and in part seven, it's Heather, you know. And then the original script, it's about Nancy and these kids and... You know, so he was all about the heroes and the heroines. He wasn't necessarily about the villain, like the villains there, but you know, it's about you know these well in his story these warriors who are trying to you know rectify this evil. Mm-hmm. You know, so Wes always kind of kept it grounded with you know story and character. That's why Nancy was to me stronger in his original version of this well his and wes's or bruce's original version of the script she was more to who she was at the end of part one in my opinion in um the original script and then because in the film she was more like a she's more like a caregiver you know because she was an adult now she was you know more like a mother figure to especially to Kristen, you know because Kristen's mother wasn't you know that great and it was like she was more like a mother figure to all these characters and you know but in the original script she was more like a more of a warrior herself like you know she was doing a lot of you know the fighting because the what was the snake scene the you know freddie coming out of the wall and like that happened to nancy in the original script that didn't happen to Kristen. freddie tried to eat her you know instead of chris so a lot of stuff that ends up happening to Kristen in the movie actually happened to nancy in the original script i know in one of the scripts uh freddie was going to be uh returned to a dragon during his fight with Laredo or Will. Like fly, yeah, fly around. Yeah, oh, fly yeah. Around. Freddy Dragon. Uh, it's in the novelization. That would have been amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would have been cool. There's no way that Robert Shea was green lighting that special effect. <laughs> There's <laughs> no way. Although I would have loved to see it. Um, in the original that script, the original script, Nancy. Um, so, like, in Dream Warriors, the theatrical version that we're talking about right now, Nancy falls for Freddy's bullshit uh, mm-hmm. magic. It, like, when, she, when he, she says, oh, it's Daddy, and he's crossing over to the other side, right? And she hugs her dad, mm-hmm. and Freddy kills her ass. In the original script, Nancy sees through it, doesn't fall for it, and they end up killing each other. Uh, mm-hmm. So, Nancy, Good. I hate, I've said it a thousand times, I hate that mm-hmm. Nancy falls for that. Because her character, based on every other interaction or every other thing we've seen from Nancy, she's a planner. She's a thinker. uh, She's always like two steps ahead of Freddy almost. She's like Kevin McAllister in Home Alone, man. She's setting her house up with booby traps and shit. She's preparing herself. She's not going to fall for that. Kevin McAllister is like Nancy Thompson. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. You're right. (laughs) Like John Rambo. John Rambo in First Blood when he's setting up wire traps in the woods of Oregon. No, so, but I'm just saying she wouldn't have fallen for that. I hated that they did that in the film. Um, She wouldn't have fallen for that. That's why it was the way it was originally because Wes knew. He knew that's how Nancy was. He knew that her development from the first one to this film, her growth. There's no way that she would have fallen for it. And I felt like in the theatrical version, it was done for shock value, which to me is really cheap, you know, because that just kind of puts a diminish on this strong character who we've known since the first one, mm-hmm. you know, to like really what she did at the first one, like, you know, set up these booby traps and like go after Freddy. She didn't wait for him to come there. She went after him, you know, so she like you said, she's a planner. She's a thinker, you know, 
and she faces things and you know and she has these smarts especially when it comes to freddie you know and they should have played it the way it was originally written instead of for shock value because like i said to me it diminished the character and like i said west was all about character and i felt mm-hmm. like with frank and chuck oh wouldn't it be neat if we did this like oh and the audience thinks that it's okay and then like oh she she ends up getting like you know i felt like they were thinking that way when you know you really should have followed what Wes and Bruce had laid out because that's really because obviously they wrote out the blueprint because there is a lot of things that are very similar in the original script that are in you know the theatrical version yes you know that they just kind of maybe switched around a little bit yeah and so they had the blueprint so that to me especially that scene they really should have followed it you know more to a T. Like, you know, the, everything with the, you know, more of the special effects and all that, you know, like I said, I think that was a great ad, you know, to do that with the marionette and you know, oh, the, yeah. Jennifer with the, the sucking mouths and like, you know, like those, I mean, that, those are really good, you know, pros, you know, to the film, but like character wise, I just felt like they, they kind of downplayed a little more, a little bit more because like I said, because they were making Freddie more the anti hero oh, yeah. in, in their version <clears throat> and like the actual villain. Josh, you, um, something similar that Anthony just said about how they played it for shock value on the screen. Like when they kill Dewey, spoiler alert in scream five, when Dewey dies, Josh, you have a very similar opinion. Um, yeah. That was totally for shock. value. I mean, cause it ends up being like the little, the girl, uh, teenager chick from that movie. Mm-hmm. That was the one. And like, she gets him in the front, stabs him in the front and the back and like pulls the blades all the way up his sternum and everything. No, like, <laughs> no, I don't, Dewey was the heart of the series, you know, I can't believe they even killed him off, it was just, it was totally for shock value, wrong character, should have been, been Gale, should have should been, been Gale, should have been Gale, should have been Gale, Dewey should have came back in the next movie, like, just completely crippled, you know, like, just, <laughs> uh, I'm here, should be. physically and emotionally crippled. <laughs> He's not even living in a trailer anymore in part six. He's in a fifth wheel. He downgraded <laughs> from the trailer to the fifth wheel. No, Gail, Gail should have been the one to go. Um, uh, so we, we now we're going to get into the characters of the episode. We already talked about Heather quite a bit as Nancy Thompson. Yeah. Let's get into a couple of the other main characters. So Craig Wasson as Dr. Neil Gordon he plays a major role in this film, and we never see him before or after this right. film. Um, do you, Josh, do you have any thoughts on why Neil Gordon was never, like, ever brought up again in the in the franchise? Okay, I don't know if it's canon really, because but that there's a book of short stories called Freddy Krueger's Seven Sweetest Dreams, and one of them is a sequel to Dream Warriors, and it's about Doctor Gordon. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting. There's some, like, time travel involved and stuff. Uh, time travel dreaming. Okay. It's, it's pretty cool. Check it out on the channel, the audiobook version. But uh, I think the reason he, he didn't pop up again, and I'm kind of glad he didn't, is because they were just trying to keep it the fresh new characters, fresh new characters. I think that's why they killed uh, killed her off in part three, you know? Uh, it's stupid. They could have kept her, they could have kept bringing her back, but... I <clears throat> I had a thought. So when the Halloween 2018 came out and they reintroduced uh, Jamie Lee Curtis to fight uh, Michael Myers as like basically a direct sequel from the original Halloween, I like I never wrote it down. OK, so if you guys want to steal this, steal it, because I'd love to see it made. I had a thought that like they could have a sequel, uh, a direct sequel from 1984's Nightmare on Elm Street. Or Dream Warriors have a sequel from Dream Warriors to whatever, pretend like Dream Master never happened. Uh, Dr. Neil Gordon's like daughter or granddaughter is in the attic cleaning out his his house because he passed away or something. And she comes across his like doctor's notes of when he's taking notes on the Dream Warriors and about their experiences with Freddy. And there's just enough energy from those notes of Freddy to like begin to haunt the granddaughter. I always thought that would have been interesting. I don't know. That was just like my little own fan fiction idea. But <clears throat> I always thought it was interesting because like Neil Gordon was obviously alive at the end of Dream Warriors. So it's like and he's still in Springwood when Dream Master was happening. So it's not like he wouldn't have been aware 
that Joey, Kincaid, and Kristen were murdered. Like, murdered. and he and he had no action. Like, he he's just like, okay, well, they're dead. Like, okay, I'm just <laughs> moving. Like, I always wondered, like, why they never. It was just like, so he just doesn't care anymore. He literally tried, he literally fought Freddy's bones <laughs> for mm. these kids. I mean, he may, he may not necessarily have been in Springwood after, because, you know, Freddy was buried and consecrated, mm. and, you know, Nancy was gone, and maybe he moved on because he was fired, you know, he was. from Western Hills. So maybe, okay. maybe he, you're right, you know, decided to move on. Like he figured, okay, if you're all safe now, he's gone, you know, just live your lives and, you know, he moved on because technically he couldn't cut co- freddie couldn't come in his dreams because he wasn't part of the mm-hmm. you know the elm street children so it's not like you know he was getting haunted by freddie you know in any way so i feel like i've always felt like maybe that's why they never brought him back maybe initially because of that because how, in a way how could he fit in in a sense you know, he, yeah, he um, get a job as a, he could be like Mr. Feeney for them. He would just get a job at Springwood High School. <laughs> it's Feeney. like he just followed them to Springwood High. Right? Really goes. Yeah. Oh, and sorry. plus, you know, part four was bogged down because, you know, that's when one of the early writer strikes happened, too. And they weren't always working with the full script on that. I felt like maybe if they were, I think honestly think that, you know, the last of the dream Rose would have lasted longer and there would have been more plot within that. And, you know, more backstory, maybe like, you know, the three, you know, before, you know, and such. But I just felt like because they weren't working with the full script, you know, they were just kind of put the basics in there. Just like, mm-hmm. okay, part three was this story. Okay, we're not working with the full deck here. So let's just try to make a new story, you know, but it's still connected to the third one. And I felt like that's that's pretty much what I felt like what they were trying to do with part four. Um, because, like I said, because they didn't have a full script. Yeah. Okay. You know, all the characters, the whole team, which we've kind of been talking about them the whole time, but uh, they're just, they, they deserve better than what they got in part four. Yeah. But I did enjoy their stuff in, in part three, their, uh, their, their nightmares and everything. So, at least, yeah. at least Ken Sago's character, Kincaid, who is my favorite Elm Street child ever. Uh, since day one, I remember seeing him on screen when I was like four and I was infatuated with his character because I was always fascinated by strength and he didn't just have physical strength. He had mental strength, too. Um, Kincaid didn't take shit from anybody. And if anybody told him otherwise, he would tell you exactly where to go. Um, (laughs) And I really like that about. Yeah, I really like that about his character. He was he wasn't just strong physically. He was extremely strong mentally and even in the scene, I know we're not supposed to talk about Dream Master, but this is real quick. In the scene where they meet Kristen's boyfriend, um, Rick, and he's like, it, it, you know, is he keeping you up at night or whatever? And then he, he, he's like, he, he says something about him and Joey sleeping together or something. Mm-hmm. And Kincaid's like, OK, well, I'm going to kick his ass right now. Right. <laughs> I just like. I love that about him. It, he, there was no bullshit with him. It's like, okay, well, I hate this guy now. Like, I'm gonna, what, I'm going to take care of this right now. Uh, I like that about his character. I try to kind of copy that in my own life, to be honest with you. Like, if I have shit going on or whatever, it's like I try to just like cut out the bullshit and like take care of business, like in that moment, and that helps me. And I think Kincaid helped me a lot. Um, let's get into Patricia Arquette, basically the star of the film, Kristen Parker. This is her first film. <clears throat> that she ever did in Hollywood, on record anyway. Uh, as Anthony was saying off camera, she's probably the most sought after scream queen to this day at conventions and at events. Um, she's really, I mean, she's just very private. Um, she has a lot of like political stuff that she does. She's very, um, she's trying to help. She's trying to, she, she's trying to help uh, everything, and she's, she's not just an actress. She's, uh, you know, she speaks out her mind on, on everything, if you follow her on Twitter. Um, you just made me think, for some reason, you made me think of, like, some really scary super leprechaun fan. Like, super <laughs> leprechaun fan, right? Yeah, just yeah. harassing, harassing and stalking Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> Your <laughs> leprechaun signature. <laughs> you just, hey. You just wrote the next Leprechaun movie, dude. <laughs> it's meta. The movie is going to be... It's not even about the Leprechaun <laughs> anymore. It's about the guy who's a fan of Warwick Davis and uh, Jennifer Aniston. And he's he's trying to get their autograph because they don't show up to conventions. And he is the villain. 
and Warwick Davis and Jennifer Aniston are the heroes of the film. <laughs> <laughs> right? What do you think? Yes. <laughs> Let's make the movie. Let's crowdfund oh, wow. it right now, dude. That's wild. <laughs> Anthony, start working on that script for us right now, dude. That's the movie. <laughs> and Willow just got canceled, dude. So Warwick yeah. Davis got time. Oh, wow. Uh, I actually didn't even know that. Yeah, it got canceled. Uh, it, that's too bad because I was a huge Willow fan. I remember playing the – do you guys remember playing the Willow arcade game? Uh, yes, I used to go down and play it at 7-Eleven. Do you remember that, Josh? I remember I the NES game that was so hard and I died in the first – I couldn't figure out what to do. Dude, Nintendo games when we were kids, um, they were, they were hard ridiculously it. hard. Some of them were ridiculously mm-hmm. hard. And Anthony, oh, we yeah. talked about on some on our previous on some podcast episodes where like you didn't have memory cards, you didn't have any of that shit. If nope. you wanted to uh, beat yeah, Super awesome. Mario Brothers three, you might have to leave the Nintendo on all night while you go to school or all day, and you might risk burning down your house. <laughs> we did that. We got time. so far in the game it's one nice time. We said we never made it this far, and we left it on pause all night. And it was hot as hell, huh? You could probably cook <laughs> an egg on top of that damn thing. Warm your hands on it if you go outside. In the yeah. Time. Hobos could put their hands over top of your NES to heat themselves. So they don't. Uh, they Freddy could burn me on, on top of that Nintendo, dude. Check out this NES, bitch. I'm going to burn some baby dolls on top of it. Oh, um, so anyway, Patricia Arquette, real quick. Super famous now. I And I, listen, I have nothing against Tuesday night. Nothing. I, I'm, just, I'm just telling hey, you guys. Wednesday nights are a little bit better. <laughs> I'm just telling you guys. <laughs> Patricia Arquette knocked it out of the park as, as Chris and Parker. Yeah. In my opinion... Right. Anybody that took over that role was screwed. I don't care mm-hmm. who it was. It was just like when Maggie Gyllenhaal took over the role in The Dark Knight, and she took over Katie Holmes' part. It, she she did such a great a good job that nobody in in the fans' minds was going to accept it. I mean, I don't know what you guys think about that. And then her I mean, character I, doesn't last that long either. Mm-hmm. Right, and it's like I. See, and I had I had seen part three before I had seen part four, so I was always so used to seeing, you know, Patricia as Kristen. Mm-hmm. So, you know, obviously I saw them in the 90s, so I didn't know about the switch. So when it happened, I was really confused as a kid. You know, I was I like bet. eight years old, and I was just like, what? Like, they can do that? They can switch people out? Like, you know, and, you know, just going back to part three, I just, for her first film, I thought she just did, like, so well. I mean, she was so mm-hmm. believable. Um, she had, like, vulnerability. She had innocence. But at the same time, she was also really strong. Because one of my, like, favorite moments with her is when they're all in that final dream. And uh, Freddie's, like, unloosening the tongues. And Joey's, like, h- like hanging over, like, that pit of fire. And, like, Nancy runs down. And she's, like, holding on to him, trying to hold him. And, like, while she's doing that, Freddie tries to sneak up behind her and, like, stab her. And, like, Kristen, like, automatically just, you know, just runs down. And she does that flip kick. And just, like, I was, like, I love that moment. It's, like, you know, it's, like, a Street Fighter game or something. Like, you know, she just comes out with this, like, force. And it's just, like, amazing. Like, I would always try to imitate that. But I could never do a flip. So I would always end up just kind of, like, jumping and, like, just landing, really. (laughs) So I did. But I would always, like, say, well, that's what I, like, this is what I'm trying to do. And she was, like, yeah, that's not even close. (laughs) <laughs> so it was like I, I mean it was just it was just such a cool moment for her like you know I love just how complex you know kind of Kristen was you know even I think Chuck Russell kind of you know even mentioned in Never Sleep Again just how like there's something like really haunting about you know Patricia Arquette you know mm-hmm. that, like you know in that that film and like you say nothing against you know Tuesday night at all because like you know I think she just did what she could with what she had. Like I said, they weren't working with the full script, and she's stepping into a role that's already been established. Mm-hmm. Like I said, anybody would have been, you know, totally screwed. screwed if they took yeah. that part. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I mean, what I did love was that they actually did make Kristen even stronger in part four. Like, you know, just how to, like, you know, uh, like how Freddie's, like, taunting Alice, and, you know, she's like, leave him alone, you son of a bitch. And, like, you know, she's just trying to, you know, just trying to fight them, and so I actually, you know, like that they made her even stronger, so I thought that was a good build for the character, like, okay, she went through all this, okay, I believe that she is this strong now, you know, after everything she's been through, it's kind of like how Wes originally wrote Nancy, like, you know, after everything she went through in part one, 
how strong she was in the original, like or stronger she was in the original script. So I, mm-hmm. I like that they built on that, and you know, I felt like too they kind of brought that fire at least, you know, that strong fire that you know, okay, this is how who Kristen is now. The essence of the character was still right. there, right? Um, so I, Kristen Parker, Patricia Arquette nailed it. I think we can all agree on that. Oh yeah. Uh, Josh, did you have any thoughts on Patricia Arquette's portrayal? Y'all pretty much covered everything I was going to say. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, I'm going to add. So the next character we talked about him just a little bit earlier, but Ken Sagos as Roland Kincaid, and I'm going to let Josh have the floor really quick because I know that you're a big fan. Uh, what do you think of, of Ken's portrayal of Kincaid? Oh, I, love, I, I love his character, man. He's like every like muscle head friend you've ever had, you know, growing up. <laughs> uh, even they're probably just big teddy bears, but it, they'll act like they'll just you know can go against anything. And for some reason, you feel confident when they're around. So mm-hmm. yeah, I can see that with his character. Really like that. That's again, we'll get we'll go over it in, in the next review, but. I think he gets bitched out really bad in the next one. Um, mm. Yeah, he's uh, he's probably right at the top of my list uh, in this movie. He he um now in the books like the the it's not fan fiction but I think it's a comic book. He actually has the ability to turn into like a Black Panther. Did you guys ever see that or read that? Did you guys ever see that? He's mm. he's a, he's mm. able to like anim- Animorph. He can turn into an animal to take on Freddy. Like I they, think I remember that. He, yeah. They make Kincaid King is a really big deal in the Nightmare on Elm Street universe. Um, sounds vaguely familiar. Like I may have may have heard something like that, but I I, I feel like um, I feel like his character. I feel like in Dream Warriors, I feel like he could have almost been the main star of the film had mm-hmm. had the film not been structured the way it was i would have liked to hear and see more backstory from him because you never ever see his parents uh you never see if he has any siblings um you never really see any of that uh he's at weston hills he's got problems he's pissed off they dispatch freddie in this movie he could dream master he's back home uh he's got his dog He's playing darts, <laughs> and then and then he goes to the junkyard, and his ass is grass. I would have liked to see some more backstory. I feel like Ken is a good actor, and he could have carried more, mm-hmm. more of the film. Um, I was gonna ask you guys, um, has Ken, like, I was always kind of like, Ken never really did a lot more movies after the Nightmare films. He did a lot of TV. He did a lot of TV. One of his bigger roles that came after Nightmare, well, it was a little bit after Nightmare, it was, uh, in the later 90s, called Rosewood. Um, Chet Bing Rames, Esther Roll, Elise Neal. Um, you know, it took place in like the 17 or 1800s. It was kind of like back in the time during like slavery. Okay. Um, and he had a significant role in that. And it, it's a really good, it's a drama, obviously. Okay. It's, a, it's a really good movie. I first saw it when I was probably like, Maybe like fourteen came on like HBO and like I didn't even know he was in it. Like you know, I just the movie had just kind of caught me when I was just you know just happened to watch it and he was in it. I'm just like you know it's Kincaid. Like that would have blew me away if I would have seen. So that. right, you know, so you know, so this is like I said, I was fourteen, so you know, this was like the you know, late nineties, early two thousand. So this is like pre streaming or oh, let me Google this real quick. Like you know, wasn't, there you is know, no just yeah just to see it. Like you know, so I had no idea he was in this film. It's like two days later, you're like, you say the answer out loud because it hits you, and everybody's like, what? And you're like, that thing I was talking about. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about, Anthony? What? <laughs> hey. I woke up. I was um, going to say about Will, the, about Will uh, the thing I really wanted more to see was more of his mental powers turning into his uh, uh, wizard powers and doing more damage. Ira? Yeah. I would have loved to have seen... Uh, him not being such a joke in his nightmare. I I, so his, like, when we interviewed Ira, we talked to him about the scene where he, so like, he, he didn't have enough time on screen, I think, to show his full uh, variety of powers that he had, obviously. And the, the, the way Freddie had positioned Will in the scene, 
there there was nowhere he could go. He blew up the wheelchair, the death wheelchair. The only place Will could go is forward. So he died a warrior's death, actually. So from like the nerdiest character in the film, he like literally pulled a Kincaid and and rushed Freddy. Like right. he ran directly into battle. Like he took yeah. him on. Like, have you seen any other character in the entire Nightmare on Elm Street franchise do that? Like, he didn't even try to go the other way. He just went straight at it. Had... No, he should have. And also, I was going to say, in the scene with Will, where they're playing Dungeons and Dragons and stuff, and Will's trying to, like, uh, they're trying to wake up uh, Bradley Gregg's character, right? Um, Will's basically like, hey, you go wake him up. You go grab this. Everybody, go do this. He's, like, kind of the leader there for a second. Like, yeah. he's kind of leading the charge, uh, low-key, to be honest with you. His character's kind of slept on a little bit. Mm -hmm. And he's the first one that says, he, like, when Nancy is, like, telling him, like, you know, we have to go into this dream to get, you know, Kristen and Joey. And she says, you know, if you die in this dream, it's for real. And she says, nobody has to go in that doesn't want to. And he's, like, the first one that says, I'm in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? he's, they never, um, so w one more thing about Will. They never, so, like, we, we're led to believe that, Freddy is the reason for him being in the wheelchair because mm -hmm. supposedly, you know, he took a fall or a jump or whatever, but we, pro we probably know that Freddy was the reason behind that. Yeah. And Freddy's just fucking with him the entire time, by the way, about him being in a wheelchair. Uh, <laughs> Cause he's like, you know, when you wake up, you know, it's back in the saddle again, <laughs> you know? So he's fucking with him. Freddy knows that he's the reason for being in the wheelchair. Freddy knows that he doesn't want to be in a wheelchair. His dream power is that he's the wizard master and he can fucking walk. And here's Freddy mm -hmm. messing with him. But Will had the guts to be like, you know what? I don't give a shit what you're saying. I'm coming straight at you. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I really like his character. Um, the next dream warrior who never gets to show his power, never really gets much anything, is Bradley Gregg. And he's Philip Anderson. And he's the one who makes the puppets. I mean, he's got some pretty good screen time in the opening scene where they're introducing us all to the kids. Mm -hmm. um, he's been in some good films, too. He was in Stand By Me. He played Eye Eyeball Chambers. Uh, yeah. He was like he was like Keeper Sutherland's like kind of like go to like right hand man in that film. Mm -hmm. um, but they never showed his dream power or anything. Yes, yes they did. His dream power is dying in a <laughs> badass way. That's his dream power. <laughs> So you remember like that that like, wait, and I'm just like, wait a minute, wait. Are you about to like really say something that I didn't know? And then <laughs> checking, like, wait, what? <laughs> it's like he's sitting down with with Wes and all the guys who are making the movie, and it's like, all right, Ira, you're the dream master. You're 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 a badass. You shoot sparks out of you. You're a, a wizard, Kincaid. You are basically like fucking the Hulk. Uh, blah 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 blah. And it's like, well, what's my what's my power? It's like, dude, <laughs> of all the dream of all the dream warriors that die. Yours is the most epic. <laughs> you are able to die better than any of the other Dream Warriors on screen, dude. Your death is phenomenal. Man. Yeah, he didn't Dream Warriors, I mean, that whole film, I mean, it's just like, I mean, it's like we, we almost come in in the middle of a story. Mm -hmm. You know, when yeah. you have the first film, it feels like, you know, it's, it's the beginning, you know, because mm -hmm. he's making the glove, it's the beginning of everything. Part two, it's the beginning of a new family. But part three, I feel like we go right into, and we're like in the middle because they're already talking about how other kids have already that were already part of that circle that were dead that we never exactly. even have to meet. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so there's like so much of this that we don't even know about. Layers and layers, right? Of stuff just, that they never told like us. how many kids were actually already in this group that were gone. You yeah. know, because what Neil says that you know they lost one kid because he cut off his own eyelids to stay awake and. I thought I mean, that was Jesse Walsh, by the way. There's always been speculation that people think that that was Jesse Walsh that that it did. That's that. what I thought. Right. I've always heard <laughs> that as a theory. Um, you know, obviously, he's never mentioned again. Like you know, like Neil Gordon. Like you know, you don't never. You know, I mean, I've always been. I'm all because you know, I'm always all about character and like you know, good triumphing over evil. So in my mind, you know, that was just the final dream of his in part two, and then you know, he's kind of like off living happily ever after. Like you know, in a sense, but you know, there. You know, they've really made some strong, um, well, a lot of fans, especially, you know, strong connection between, you know, Jesse Walsh and that character that's mentioned about cutting off their own eyelids. Well, you know. maybe, I think, maybe he didn't, maybe him and Lisa have a bunch of Elm Street babies, and they're driving <laughs> right. the deadly dinosaur around, 
uh, my problem with Jesse was like, and this is the same problem Josh has with Jesse is like, you know, we know he's innocent, uh, but you know, forensics is going to tell a whole different story. You know, he killed all those, <laughs> he killed all those people. If there was any crime scene investigators that knew anything about being a, a investigator, Jesse's, and there's in, at least, Jesse's in prison. There's at least three or four <laughs> Jesse Walsh husks laying yeah. around town as well. Because, dude, Freddie came out of Jesse's body like two or three, three or times. four times. Right. Yeah, so there's there's three husks laying around town. <laughs> yeah, there's <laughs> Jesse's like, DNA <laughs> everywhere. Like, everywhere. Grady's room, the high school shower, uh... <laughs> The, well, the maybe club. they didn't have it fully back then, so maybe it's like one of those things I see on ID where it's like now it's like 2006 and DNA has come a long way. The spring, hey, where the are spring, they <laughs> dude, the Springwood Forensic Investigation Unit. Uh, Jesse Walsh is like running oh, the Jesus. hardware store or something in town, and he drinks a Diet Coke, and then the, the guy like gets his DNA from the Coke, and then he matches it to all these Jesse Walsh bodies, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Like you're and under the, just, under yeah. arrest for the murder of Ron Grady back in 1985. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cold case. He's like, what? And then Lisa's like, this is bullshit. My family's rich. We're gonna hire the most fucking powerful lawyer ever to defend to defend it. Oh man. Uh, That's hey. Weird. So let let's get into. Uh, we already talked about Ira a little bit. Let's talk about Penelope Sudro as Jennifer Caulfield. Um, she doesn't get a lot of screen time. But she is, gentlemen, she is responsible for the Freddy Krueger that everybody, <laughs> if you ask who Freddy Krueger was, and it's not a fan of Freddy Krueger, they would know who he was based on the welcome to primetime bitch mm-hmm. because of this character. Right. And I uh, think her character is fan. Like, I love the character. I mean, in a sense, I mean, I remember being younger and I thought she was kind of annoying because she's always like, uh, uh, but then mm-hmm. like, you know, when you get older and you have a different perspective, like. Her character and the way Penelope played her was so good, you know, because she Orchard. is this, you know, this girl who's, you know, she, you can see, like, because everybody has their own way of, like, dealing with Freddie and, like, their struggle with Freddie. Like, you know, Kincaid, he's more angry. And, you know, uh, Kristen draws, like, you know, she puts all her frustration and then, like, you know, Jennifer just has this thing, especially with her cigarettes, you know, she's just burning herself and she's just, like, you know, she's, like, she kind of has, like, the switch. I would always just see her and she's just kind of, like, she can't keep still. You know, she's trying to, like, get somewhere. And that's what she's always talking. She wants to leave. Like, she wants to be She wants to be in California. She wants to be an actress, you know. Mm-hmm. And I thought, like, Penelope play, played her so well. And, you know, just... Honestly, I thought all those kids just played off each other so well. For something, something about, like, you know, actors in the 70s and 80s. I mean, even, like, 60s and 50s. I mean, they... That group that they hired, I mean, they just worked off each other so well, and those young actors were just so good in those roles. No matter how big the role was or how small it was, they just were so good. I mean, it's a little bit different compared to today. It's like, it, it, it's a it's a different kind of tone, mm-hmm. you know, but there was something about the <clears throat> 80s where it was so much more authentic, I feel like, you know, it was just I, so natural. I think, I, think, I think the 70s, the 80s, and the early 90s, uh, pre-cell phone, pre-internet, Mm-hmm. When you actually had to get to know somebody and spend time with them and and to bond offset or to actually like because I remember listening to Heather Langenkamp talk about how like she's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, me, jo- me and Johnny Depp actually like went on a date. Like we hung out mm-hmm. like we got to know each other. So we, we were going to play boyfriend and girlfriend on, on camera. It's right. like and I remember Corey Feldman specifically telling the same story like 100 times about when they were in The Lost Boys, they both got uh, cast. Him and Corey Haim met together at the beach and they played football and they just went and had lunch and they just became buddies. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's harder to do that nowadays because I think it's hard to have a conversation with anybody now because everybody's like looking at their phone. Uh, right. I, it's like social media has a place. It's helpful for a lot of things. I would have never mm-hmm. met you, Anthony, if it wasn't for social media. Right. Um, it, it's helpful. But at the same time, if you don't use it correctly, it can really mess mm-hmm things up and i think it is very apparent in you know tv and movies now i think that yeah. chemistry off screen leads to chemistry on screen how about oh, that oh yeah a hundred a hundred percent i mean because yeah. we're now when i see like if i'm looking at somebody's story you know they're like maybe like looking at an actor that's not really paying attention to them they're like always on their phone mm-hmm. you know what i mean you can always just see them like 
doing, you know, scrolling through, and they look at, ah, like, they caught me, you're looking at yeah. them, but they're always on their phone, nobody's really, like, engaged, really, like, talking to each other, or engaged with one another, it's mm-hmm. like, you know, it's like you said, it's like, you know, the phones have kind of taken over, and I, and I think that's where a lot of that stuff is lost now, because like you said, back then, because they would always talk about um, how sometime when they were done with the shoot for the day, they'd all go out and eat. I remember that being like in one of the, I think Ira Hyde might have said something like that. In one That's of the huge. Movies. Like they go out to eat and, you know, just hang out. And they said, like, we're still friends to this day, like a lot of us. And they are, if you go to the convention and see them, they are still just like buddies, you know. Yes. And it's that, it's that bond, like, you know, that it makes it really authentic. And that's what Wes... That's what I always say. That's what Wes was really good at was the bonding of like teenagers or the bonding of kids. You know, whether it's, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street or Scream and, you know, it's all about the bond because it's like when you really are focused on that group, you really are, you know, you're involved in what's happening to them. Like Mm -hmm. each each one of those kills, like, I mean, you really feel for them. I mean, you really feel for Philip. I mean, just his face, that's how pitiful he looks because he can't control himself. And yeah. Jennifer, when he's, even though it's, you know, it's a prime time, but you just, I mean, her fear, like, you know, this is a girl who just wanted to go to Hollywood and be an actress, and now, you know, her face is crushed into a television, and, you know, with Taryn, a girl who struggled with drugs, and he's, you know, using that, you know, let's get hot, and like, you know, and you see her, like, went back, and she's crying, like, that's, like, that's all actually, to her, almost scarier than Freddy, mm-hmm. and, you know, that- when she was fighting him, she was just like, oh, like, you know, like, yeah, like, you know, she was ready for him, like, you know, but... She sees those drugs and it's like, and like she, yeah. you know, and it's, you know, so it's like you really get involved with these because it's really hitting on things that people really deal with. You know, there's yeah. people who were dealing with drugs at that point and it's like drugs are like more important than anything to them. And like, you know, so they understand that, you know, or, you know, people who are just trying to escape or people who have a bad home life like Kristen and they're just like their parents aren't understanding them and it's you know that's what i mean by the like the authenticity of that you know and yet he would freddie would co- in what you said about Kristen, he would continually put her back in her nightmares in the house like right. w- it, with her mother it's like mm-hmm. okay here you go you're back like it's like dude sometimes the only <laughs> escape sometimes the only escape you have as a kid uh growing up in a pretty awful environment like i did like my escape was i'm going over to anthony's house i'm going over to josh's house get me the hell out of here i don't care what we're doing just get me out of this environment uh Mm -hmm. but freddie we just kept putting her back in (laughs) because she couldn't even leave that house man and as far as like uh taryn with her drugs uh it's no secret that i was an alcoholic for years and i i can only imagine what freddie would use for you would probably put me right back in a bar i guarantee it <laughs> and i have dreams to this day guys uh not freddie related or anything but like i'll have dreams where i'm drinking and i'll wake up and it was so real that um i have to like go through my thoughts and realize that i didn't actually drink the night before i'll be oh, afraid wow. yes i will be afraid that i drank because i can taste it I can feel it. I get buzzed in my dreams. It's weird. Um, it happens. Uh, so, you know, whoever, you know, Wes and all those guys writing these scenes, uh, they nailed it with the Terran mm-hmm. thing. That that one hit home for me. My mom died of hepatitis C from uh, needles. So mm-hmm. I remember when I, I had seen that scene with my mom and my mom got real quiet and I never understood. I never processed it as a child why she was always uncomfortable around that scene and i know why she was uncomfortable around it now because that's what she was directly dealing with in her own life right Um, so yeah freddie's a bastard and he's a genius (laughs) so i mean seriously like you know like i said everybody has their favorites and i get to I'll, i'll never bash anybody for saying oh you like this over this person but for me personally that's why i feel like he's the strongest and the most deadly is because the way he preys on people. It's not just, oh, yeah. I'm going to come up behind you and stab you with a knife or, or with a rake yeah. or whatever it is. I'm going to, like, exactly. mind fuck you first, like, until you're, like, shriveled up, and then I'm going to crush you. Yeah. you know he does I mean? got to have like, his fun before he, before he finishes you off, man. Yeah. I, me being, like, a writer now, like, writing stories, I feel like I look at horror movies so differently now. Than what I did, like when I was a teenager, or when I was a kid. It's like now, like when you go back and rewatch it, it's like my mind. Even like new movies I see at the movies now, it just starts breaking things down like differently. And I'm like watching it scene by scene, and just 
watching those those particular moments or watching for those particular moments and seeing how a character reacts to something and uh versus how this character reacts to something um and especially for somebody like Wes he would always put stuff in there in the scripts deliberately like that and it was up to us as the viewer to catch him you know cuz I would listen to a lot of his interviews and he would go back and explain certain things like I did this this and certain things I would catch, I said, oh, I said, and that's actually what I thought that that's what it was about, you know, but somebody might else might see and just like, oh, this thing was just, oh, he just came and just did this and yeah. you know, whatever. But, yeah, yeah, like a know, throwaway but, or something. Right, but it's always, it's like always this like strategic move on his part or, you know, or was a strategic move on his part with his stories. And that's what I always loved about the Nightmare series because you got to dive into that deeper because like I said, it's all, all in the mind, you know? Yeah. Um, the last character that we're going to talk about, uh, before we get into actually grading, reviewing the film, the title of the show, we're going to talk about everybody's favorite horn dog. We're going to, <laughs> we're going to talk, we're going to talk about Rodney Eastman as Joey Crusoe. And I just found out he had a last name guys. Uh, when I did the research for this episode, Crusoe, Joey Crusoe. <laughs> Oh, you didn't know um, that was his last name? <laughs> that's his last name, C-R-U-S-E-L. Right. And Rodney Eastman, I had never seen Rodney. Um, I've seen Rodney and Thing other productions since Dream Warriors. The only thing I had ever seen um, him in around the time Dream Warriors was released was he was in a couple episodes of Who's the Boss? I had yeah. never... Yeah, I like was watching... There's an episode where Tony Danza gets Alyssa Milano a car... And it's like the ultimate safe car. It's a boat and it's got reflectors all over it. One of the kids who keeps giving her shit is Rodney Eastman. Like he's the <laughs> cool kid. Um, but I always thought this is going to sound weird. Rodney Eastman was like low key handsome. I always thought he could have had a chance as like a leading man type of deal. I kind of wonder. I mean, he has charisma for sure. I mean, he pulled off a character without even speaking right. uh, for the entire film. You know how hard that is, Josh? Can you imagine, like, you get to say, you, you're a star of the film, okay, Josh? You're, you're on the poster, but you get two lines of dialogue the entire film. You got to pull everything off with your face and your, and your get, looks. I get, I get paid the same as if I'm talking? Yes. Cool. Let's do it. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but we're tying your ass up to a bed uh, upside down, and you're going to be on that bed <laughs> with a bone. So, so, it's, so it's just another Tuesday night, okay? Uh, a Tuesday <laughs> We're tying you up to the bed with a boner, Josh, and oh, wow. uh, you're gonna I have know, blood loss. How did, hey guys, how did he not die? Because if he's if he's tied up right, and the blood is dropping from his <laughs> arms, right, and then that's what kills you in a crucifixion. But he's also turned on by the nurse, right? Because she tried to kill his ass, so he's got an erection. So the blood flow is going to that. He's got double <laughs> blood loss, guys. He's dead. I never really cared much for Joey, honestly. What? Eh. Bite your tongue. Oh, uh, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> this show's I over. Just, <laughs> yeah, bye. Bye, Joey. Have fun. He was seriously like Joey. Um, There wasn't like a lot of layers to him, but like I swear <laughs> to God, Wes probably wrote him like this character is like every teenage male in America. Like he 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 likes chicks. That's That's it. That is his character, right? You don't remember being like that at all, like as a, as a teenager, just a little bit, like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just didn't like Joey. So. Well, you, you can say in the sense that Freddie kind of was the one that like, like he was so staunch by fear, like you know Freddie took his voice because you know Jennifer mentions that you know he was a debater in school, yeah. and then you find out that's his that's his power, like in his dreams and in real life, it's his voice, like he has a commanding voice apparently. Wow. You know, I never thought about that. And so, like, that's what Freddie took, you know, because he was so paralyzed by what was going on that he just couldn't speak anymore. He just stopped talking because he was terrified of what was going terrified. on. That's what I say. Freddie knows he knows the strengths and he knows that, you know, it's up to them to like, you know, kind of. It's like how Wes said, it's like not that you're fearless, but you realize that there's more than fear at play. So you have to take the fear but you have to find the strength too and work with them both. Yeah. I'm afraid, but I still have to keep moving forward. Yeah. That you that's know? dude. Um they I heard Mike Tyson say something extremely similar to that. He said every fight he ever went into, he was terrified. 
like believe it or not he was terrified but he would he would find a way to use that fear mm-hmm. to unleash it into action on his opponent so it's not like he went into a fight and was like ultimately supremely confident like he was terrified right. he used mm-hmm. it for his own benefit like he he bottled it up because he would say like if i let this fear consume me it's going to burn me up but if i can harness it i'm going to be able to use it and explode on my opponent so mm-hmm. that's that's crazy that you said that because that's that that that's so true uh that's fear can paralyze it. you i mean because most of us i mean a lot of people don't go into anything you know fully with like a hundred percent confidence whether you're going into like Not me a presentation or um, you're going into a job interview or you're going into an audition for, you know, nobody, I feel like a lot of people, I mean, yeah, there could be somebody say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm at the top of my game. I just, feel, I'm like, I'm going to crush this. But most average people, like, you know, they're like, you hear people like, Ooh, I'm like, I'm terrified. Like, mm-hmm. But you know, you have to do it. Yeah. And you know, you just find whatever it is you need to like move forward. And that, that's what I felt each dream warrior, like that, what they were and like, and especially Nancy being there, she was almost like a guy for them to like realize like yeah freddie is this being he's this entity he's this dark figure but you can beat him you know you just have to kind of rise above all of that and mm-hmm. like she was almost like the light to that because she had already done it you know so she was in a way an inspiration to all of them because they know okay he's been defeated already because nancy's already defeated him mm-hmm. so how and can she's alive I, she's uh, right here yeah right and so how can I now, as, you know, whichever dream were, how can I get to that point, you know, to do it? Because, you know, I mean, you could tell that they were all, like, you know, when, like I said, even going back to that scene where she says, you know, nobody has to go in that doesn't want to. Like I said, Will was the first one that says, like, I'm in, but you can kind of see him, like, hesitate at first, where they're mm-hmm. just kind of looking at each other, like, but they're just like, you know, okay, let, let's go. You, you know? gotta do it. Or no, I don't know, like, because I felt like Nancy had that. She had that, because that, that's, I always say resolve is one of my favorite words out of the entire English language. And people just kind of looking like resolve, like, but resolve is so powerful. It has such a strong meaning. It means like whatever it is that's plaguing you as a person, no matter mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, you know, you at you get to that point where you're just saying, I don't know what's going to happen, but I just need to handle this. And it's like, to me, with her in part one, she sets up all those booby traps. She doesn't know if she's going to come out victorious or not. She just knows one way or another, it's going to be over. Mm-hmm. Whether, you know, I'm going into the stream, we're going to get him. He may get me, I may get him, but regardless, it's going to be over. But I have to at least try or I have to go forward because mm-hmm. you're not going to know until you actually do it. That's, you know? that's like Josh when you decided you were going to kick pain pills and you knew you had to do it and you did it Mm -hmm. like that's the same thing dude that's it's like you did you didn't know what the hell was going to happen but you knew you had to fix it right so that's impressive what you had to do you had that resolve like you had that resolve like within you somewhere that says okay mm -hmm. i need to it's you know whatever this is it's it's either going to get me or or i'm going to get it yeah but i'm going down right i'm going down with a fight fight. yeah with a fight Right. Uh, that's how I. That's kind of how I felt, guys. Like when I was, when I was like pushing four hundred pounds. Like I, there were some days where I was, I'd show up and I'd tie my shoes and stuff. But I knew, I didn't know if I was going to lose weight, and I didn't know, because the first two or three months I worked out, I didn't lose anything. So I would like put all this effort into something, and I not, I had no results at all. So it was like having faith in the unknown. I guess mm-hmm. resolve like that. I'm just going to, ki- I don't give a shit what happens. I'm either going to die being fat or I'm going to die out there on this road trying to fight it. There was mm-hmm. nothing. I mean, there, there were times when I was out there on like a five or six mile run and I thought I might die. Seriously. I mean, I'm being honest with you. Um, I believe it. Everybody has, I mean, Anthony, you were bullied as a kid. You mm-hmm. had shit go down constantly. Um, I wish I was there to have your back. <laughs> like, seriously, <laughs> that would have been fantastic. Uh, but like everybody has their shit. It's so weird how like all these different people from different walks of life and different parts of the country, everybody has their shit and it's different. It's like, my parents were terrible. Like you were bullied. You had shit going on, right? Josh had his shit going on. He had wonderful hair. Uh, he's glowing. He's got all these great things at the same time. 
Josh had his demons too. It's weird how everybody has their own fight. And I always say to people that you should be kind to people because you never know what the hell they're going through. You don't know. Right. You have no idea. Like you could be an asshole to somebody at McDonald's and you could have just been an asshole to somebody whose mom just passed away from cancer or their girlfriend just like they just found out they were cheating on them or they mm -hmm. might have just found out that their kid they were raising wasn't like biologically their child. You don't know. You have no idea. Or their, or their burger wasn't made the way they wanted. <laughs> exactly. You know what, Josh? That's exactly the same. Like if they if they didn't want pickles and they got it, man. That and yeah. I feel bad for the McDonald's employee, dude. Right? Because they're about to ready to get lit up. I will say pretty much everything you guys just said about the characters and the resolve and everything is why I can't give the movie like a perfect score as oh. far as ratings go. I'm going to go with like a three out of four because pretty much everything you guys just said, but I think that they should have treated Nancy a little bit better. I don't think she would have fell for Freddy's trap that easily. His glimmer? Yeah. Just, oh, yeah. uh, you know, she'd know better than to hug her dad like that. And I don't know. That part just takes a point away for me, or else it'd be a perfect score. So I'm and three finger nine out of four. So you're hard giving it. champion for that. <laughs> you're giving it three finger knives out of four, then, huh? Yeah. Yeah. You gave yeah. Freddy's Revenge two and a half finger knives, didn't you? I know. I know. It, man, it's the way they, they, they mess with Nancy. Did you give the original Nightmare on Elm Street, did you give it four finger knives? I don't think so. Three and a half. It, was, it wasn't four. <laughs> I think it was like three and a half. Three and a half. Um, oh, if I was on that show, that one got four for me. <laughs> I, I think I gave it three and a half or three and three quarters finger knives. Um, so based on everything, Freddie, the characters that we've uh, talked about in, in depth, the special effects, which we t touched on a little bit, which were phenomenal practical effects for that time. Mm -hmm. uh, the marionette scene, the sucking uh, IV drug scene, um, mm -hmm. even Jennifer's oh. head, like the veins, like her dying was good. Even though they didn't get to do the practical effect they wanted to use, it still was very convincing. Yeah. Uh, the plot <laughs> is phenomenal. Uh, I don't have anything bad to say about this movie, except for I wish that... Uh, some of the dream warriors were actually featured a little bit more prominently and that they weren't killed so quickly. Like you never really got to see what Jennifer and, and Philip or Jennifer. Yeah. Jennifer and Philip could do. They're kind of just throwaway characters to move the plot along almost. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're like a plot device. Um, I don't, the only thing that doesn't hold up for me, CGI or like practical effects wise would probably be the Freddy skeleton. Um, the stop go yeah. animation doesn't hold up that well, but it's still really good for what they were working with for the time. Yeah. Um, uh, the music, the Doc and Dream Warriors, I mean, they got a platinum album from a single in a slasher film, which is ridiculous. That's that's absurd, guys. Like that movie, that movie was a oh, phenomenon. I... It was it was huge. Anything that touched that film was gold. Um, I'm going to give this film, I'm going to give it four out of four finger knives. Oh, I think okay. it is a perfect film, even though the stop the stop animation where he's fighting this guy, I think it's a perfect movie. I forgot a little bit about the stuff they did on special effects and like the reverse filming thing was pretty cool, you know, where it looks like it's consuming, but it's actually just going, it's going backwards or whatever. Like yeah, that, oh, yeah. that mm -hmm. made it look really creepy in the movie. So, yeah, with the skeleton fight is part of the fun. I love Army of Darkness as well. So uh, I, I'll, I'll go to three and a half out of four. I just can't, I can't, I can't go to four because of what they did with Nancy. That's all. Anthony, what are, what are you mm -hmm. grading it, buddy? With all that, because what you guys are saying, like, especially the big thing with me with Nancy. Um, and like I said, even though I can appreciate, you know, Freddie how he was in Nightmare 3, that, that blend. I'm, I'm always still more pro of how Freddy was in Part 1 and Part 2. Dark. You know, just that dark. Um, yeah, that's fair. So, even, like, with all that, because everything you said, um, you know, about, you know, the, the special effects and, obviously, the, the score and the, uh, the, the music, like, all that I love. Like, I thought it was so good for the times. 
um, especially like the Hall of Mirrors. That's like one of my favorite ones. Like you that's, know, yeah, which that's still that, up to this day. Which is still one of my favorite ones. Which I don't know if you guys know, like off topic. Well, not really off topic, but you know, real quick. Like a lot of people don't know sometimes that the Dream Warriors and Nancy, they're all in the dollhouse. They're not in 1428 in the fighting. They're in the dollhouse. Because if you ever see when those mirrors explode after Joey screams no, you can see the paper, the newspapers that Kristen has, you know, that she was working on. Yeah. To build everything. They're in the dollhouse. They're not in 1428. What? I did, what yeah. the hell? You just blew my mind. I did not know that. A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't realize that, and it's like, it, and they kind of give it away a little bit early on when you know Kristen's screaming for Nancy and she pulls Nancy in her dream. She's screaming from the dollhouse. Yes, I do. I remember that. I yeah. and, and and also Neil, Doctor Neil Gordon has the dollhouse at the end of the film, and the light turns on because Nan, Heather Nancy's going to be the. The, the guardian, yeah, that's supposed, the to be, guardian. supposed to be the guardian of the good right? dream. So that's supposed to be Nancy that turns yeah. on the light, not Freddie. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, what's your grade, Anthony? What are you saying, bud? So I give it. I give it the same as Josh. So I give it three and a half out of four. Ah, cool. So, <laughs> Slashaholics. So, I'm gonna say three and a half, three and a half, four. It's almost three and three quarter finger knives. So, to date, Dream Warriors has the highest place uh-huh. on the Slash Tracks reviews <laughs> movie rankings system. So, Freddy's. <laughs> Freddy's Revenge is no longer in second. It moved to third. <laughs> moved to third. <laughs> and we'll see what happens in the next episode of Slash Tracks Reviews with uh, Dream Master and Halloween 2018. And Anthony, I want to thank you so much uh, for doing the show and for being my friend. And this has been a lot of fun, dude. I, I had a blast with you guys. Josh, I have a blast with you doing anything. We could read the newspaper together and I would have a blast. <laughs> But, um, I get, like emotional on this thing, man. Come on. I want people I'm just, seeing me like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I gotta stay, I gotta stay hard in front of everybody. I'm mad no, hard. I've got this extremely bright, uncovered light that's like shining right down on me, so I can't look up and it's like making me have to squint. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like sweating. <laughs> so well, so like here. halfway through it's gonna look like I'm <laughs> <laughs> Well, seriously, guys, thank you for doing the show. And Slashaholics, be on the lookout for Anthony Brownlee's books and be on the lookout for Fred Heads. It's available on Amazon Prime. It's coming to Tubi. Uh, Anthony, one more time, where can they find you on the socials and where can they find your books? Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, and you can also find me, uh, or sorry, you can find my books on any of my social platforms uh, in my bios. There's always a direct link to Amazon, uh, to my books. And since we're on the topic of Nightmare, my book Bloodshed is actually an homage to A Nightmare on Elm Street. So we got the Nightmare fans out here who want to kind of check that out. Even though it doesn't have anything yeah. to do with the dream demon or dreams, it's the way that's set up. And I think a lot of the Nightmare fans will get the subtle hints. Okay. Okay. Ken Sagos, uh, Kincaid, uh, just recently promoted one of your books too, huh? I saw that yeah. on. Yeah, that's, he got my thriller, which was really cool. <laughs> that's big time, dude. That's that. Nice. So you heard it. Ken Sagos is a is a Mark Anthony Brownlee fan. So Josh, <laughs> in the show, buddy. Uh, shoot us an email at slash tracks twenty twenty at gmail dot com. Be excellent to each other, and we'll see you soon. Good night, everybody. Mm-hmm. Mahalo. Sweet dreams.